Good morning, everyone. Bonjour et bienvenue. Welcome to the CanCham webinar, Reopening Hong Kong, Vaccination and its Impact on Traveling. My name is Amélie Dunchard, and I am the co-founder of the medical insurance brokerage and advisory firm AD Medilink and of the online health informa information platform, Healthy Matters. And as some of you may know, I also have a third full-time job. I am chair of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong, a non-profit, non-governmental organization that was created in 1977. And today we have over 1,100 members representing nearly 300 companies. This makes us one of the largest Canadian business organizations outside of Canada and one of the most active international chambers in Hong Kong. And for the non-Canadians listening in this morning, it's important for you to know that we are an inclusive and diverse community. In fact, 40% of our membership is non-Canadian and everyone is welcome. So now what do we do at the Canadian Chamber? We deliver four services to our members, representation and advocacy engagement. Number two, business promotion, networking and brand exposure. Number three, learning and training. And number four, information and insight. And today we are bringing you key information and insight about Hong Kong's vaccination program and its potential impact on this morning's event. I'd like to pause and acknowledge some key members of our community who are participating to this morning's event. Canadian Consul General Jeff Nenke Bell, Consul and Senior Trade Commissioner Patricia Elliott, the Director of Bureau du Québec à Hong Kong, Gabriel Chartier, Governor David Armitage, and Kanchan Vice Chair and Managing Director for CIBC Asia Pacific, Alex Tan. And so this morning, we have a stellar panel of experts who will share information and insights about COVID-19 vaccination and traveling. As you know, there is a never a dull moment in the pandemic. <laughs> Yesterday, Hong Kong's authorities ordered a sudden lockdown for mandatory testing of residents in another neighborhood, hours after the city's chief executive revealed that the Hong Kong government had asked Beijing for help in securing vaccines from the state-owned Sinopharm. So today we will cover the three vaccines that the entire world is talking about. And please let me briefly introduce our speakers. So from the travel industry, we have Todd Hancock, who is president for Collinson Asia Pacific. And Todd has over 25 years of regional experience, having lived and worked in Indonesia, Singapore, Japan, and Hong Kong. Todd is also the immediate past chair of our chamber and has been a wonderful leader of our chamber in the past three years. Our community is hugely grateful towards Tom. And you have, may have seen him in the news last week because Collinson just launched with Singapore Airlines a pre-departure COVID-19 test for passengers. From the medical industry, we have Dr. Sarah Barwain, general practitioner and the most well-known Canadian physician in Hong Kong. In addition to being a Canadian trained GP, Dr. Barwain st studied infectious disease epidemiology at the London School. She is one of the founding members of Central Health and has been practicing family medicine in Hong Kong for over 15 years. And during SARS, Dr. Barwain was a frontline doctor in Beijing and acted as the WHO liaison. And from academia, we have Dr. Karen Grépin, Associate Professor at School of Public Health here at HKU. Dr. Grépin is a health economist and health system researcher. Her research focuses on institutional factors affecting the demand and supply of health services. She's currently working on a fascinating study that she'll share more about with the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, the International Developmental Research Centre and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And lastly, we have with us from the airline industry, uh, Han Lam, an airline industry veteran. Han Lam is the general manager for Air Canada for Hong Kong and Southern China. He started his aviation career in in-flight services with Cathay Pacific, then spent 10 years with British Airways, worked for Virgin Atlantic and has been with Air Canada for two years. And let me share with you our sessions rundown this morning. 
Each speaker will be given a five minute opening address to share more about their work and their thoughts on the current situation here in Hong Kong. I will then ask some questions that I've prepared in advance. And lastly, we will aim at a 15 minute open Q&A so you participants get to ask your questions. Now there will be two ways for you to ask questions. At the bottom of your screen, there's a chat box and if you prefer asking questions that way you can write your question I will try to manage it as best as I can alternatively you can unmute yourself uh, and also show a video of yourself if you feel comfortable doing so and ask your questions directly to our participants so now I will hand it over to Todd Hancock for his uh, opening address over to you Todd thanks very much Amelie and uh, thanks for the uh... The nice introduction there. <clears throat> so uh, since the COVID, since COVID started, um, we at Collinson have been leveraging what is a 55-year history in, in medical assistance and travel experience. Every year, uh, we support literally millions of, of people as they travel around the world, expats around the world. We do several thousand uh, medical evacuations around the world. Um, and we, we pivoted during the COVID period to leverage our uh, our skills, experience, our medical staff, doctors, nurses, et cetera, um, and hotlines to establish a, a testing uh, capability. Um, that has already included over 100,000 COVID-19 tests in support of travelers, organizations, uh, airlines, airports, governments um, in, in multiple locations. Um, and as I, um, Amelie said uh, a few minutes ago, we, uh, we had announced our partnership with Singapore Airlines just last week. Um, that first phase is um, pre-departure testing out of uh, Jakarta and Medan into Singapore, as outbound testing from Singapore to, to multiple locations. Uh, future phases, the next phase will actually include Hong Kong to Singapore, UK to, Hong, uh, to Singapore, um, and then we'll continue to expand in support of, of that effort. Um, we're also um, uh, collaborating with, uh, with Air Canada and, and Han out of, out of Heathrow um, into Canada. That's something that we've we put together actually as a direct result of the, the membership in the, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Han and I got to know each other and we were able to connect the dots between our, our Toronto, his Toronto offices and my London offices. So um, the Canadian Chamber of Value, absolutely happening there uh, within the community. Um, in the UK, we are set up for uh, testing um, out of Heathrow, London City, Luton, Manchester Airports Group. Um, but we're also one of the designated partners for the UK government's test to release program. So uh, 10 day quarantine can be cut um, by five days doing on a, on a test to release basis. Uh, so we're, we're one of the, uh, the small number of organizations that are um, participating in that. We're also working very closely with the likes of Common Pass, um, IATA, the International Air Transport Association, um, and other digital health uh, passport trials um, as, as people try and, try and figure out how do we get multilateral collaboration and sharing of information um, into, into place. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, obviously, the industry, and I know Han, Han has, uh, has, has felt this significantly, is you know, it, it plummeted overall by 60% in the past year, and in many months it was down as much as 95%. Uh, we have an air, airport uh, lounge business, um, so we've, we felt it uh, extremely hard, and we have seen it down um, some months as low as 98% down. Um, luckily, we're starting to see that pick up. We're seeing it pick up primarily in domestic markets like India, uh, like China, Vietnam, Thailand, where domestic travel is, is actually happening um, in Europe. Uh, strangely enough, we're seeing very high levels of travel in, uh, domestically in Europe, in Russia, which is uh, one of the highest uh, uh, infection rates in, in the world in Russia. So it's, it's curious to see that some markets continue to see that, that traveling. Um, the... <clears throat> We, while we re remain optimistic about you know vaccines and vaccination rollouts, uh, we we do see that you know multilateral collaboration um, around the opening of travel is very much contingent on the vac vaccination rollouts, the the execution of such, the agreement on different protocols. Does do I in Australia accept whatever testing or vaccination regime was put out in the United States, States for example, and and as a result, 
result of that, we forecast that we're going to see as vaccinations roll out that testing isn't going to go away anytime soon, that they will coexist for some time into the future. Oh, I think you're on mute, maybe. Dominic. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. And hoping that you and Collinson and Air Canada can work on, on making sure we resume traveling to Canada easily and get to see our, our families in 2021, crossing our fingers. I will now hand it over to uh, Dr. Sarah Barwain. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Emily. It's really nice to be here. I'm actually talking about some maybe sort of good news, at least, instead of all the bad news we've talked about for the last year. And as many of you know, I've spent much of the past year, well, not only figuring out how to deliver primary health care during a pandemic, but also talking about COVID. And uh, it's my second time round, so there's some deja vu because I did much the same thing during SARS in Beijing. Uh, and SARS ended really due to, to effective public health measures, at least that's what it seems. Felt very bizarre at the time because nobody really believed it would never come back and yet it didn't, not in exactly in the same form. And it looks like COVID is also going to be controlled through a combination of public health measures, which will this time include vaccines. Uh, so the vaccines are kind of the light at the end of the tunnel, but the tunnel is still pretty long. I hate to say it, but it's not over yet. It's still good news though. So a little background just very briefly about the vaccines that are being, uh, should be available in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong has, uh, has announced that it's procured three different vaccines, the Pfizer BioNTech mRNA vaccine, uh, which is made in Belgium, but will be distributed by the Shanghai-based uh, company Folsom Pharmaceuticals, Sinovac, which is a Chinese vaccine, and the AstraZeneca vaccine, from, uh, which is a UK-Swedish uh, vaccine. So all of these vaccines require two doses, a few weeks apart, depending on the vaccine. Um, and um, there's also an attempt to procure a fourth vaccine. Initially, they said it might be Novavax, which is a different method of vaccination, different kind of platform. But yesterday it was in the paper that they're talking about trying to get Sinopharm, another Chinese vaccine. So we can talk more about the differences between the vaccines. Uh, but um, on Tuesday, the Pfizer vaccine actually became the first vaccine to receive official emergency use approval in Hong Kong. Uh, with 1 million doses expected later in February, whenever that is. So it looks like this will be the first vaccine deployed. And the distribution of the vaccines is going to be managed by the government. I often get asked, are you going to be able to give it in your clinic? And the answer is no, definitely not with Pfizer, which requires very strict cold chain management and apparently is also jiggle sensitive. So you uh, have to be careful with how you, how you manage the vaccine. It will be given in community centers for sure. Uh, as for the other vaccines, we don't know yet, but the, vac the government's promised that the vaccine will be free for everyone and it will be managed at least initially in the public system. In fact, they've even sent us a letter telling us it's a criminal offense for us to try and bypass the system and import other vaccines. So last summer, I, I remember I was on a social call with some of my infectious disease public health friends. One was in the UK and the other in Australia. And my Australian colleague at the time locked down in Melbourne asked, do you, do you really think we'll be able to develop a vaccine for this? I mean, I feel it's kind of hopeless. And we all kind of sighed and agreed. And the reason was that respiratory viruses have actually proven very tricky to develop effective vaccines for. We have some, but the efficacy rates aren't great. And it's even, it's been hard to get people to accept them. Look at influenza vaccine, the rates that we get people to accept them are not that high. So, and with a disease as transmissible as COVID is, we would actually need a large proportion of the population to be vaccinated with a highly effective vaccine to really control it that way. So all three of us kind of sighed at the thought that this would never happen, just like it never happened for HIV. Uh, another pandemic that I remember being at the start of and where we hoped a vaccine would control it, but that hasn't been the route that it's taken. So the fact that we have several vaccines that look to be not just effective, but some of them highly effective is kind of a miraculously positive development. And it's reasonable to feel hope and relief about that. But unfortunately, the vaccines don't flick an off switch on the pandemic. 
And as you've probably heard many times, vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations do. And getting vaccines into people's arms is neither easy nor quick. So for travel to restart without restrictions, we need one of two things. We either need to know that being vaccinated means you don't pass COVID on to others. And we don't know that yet. Or we need enough of the population to be vaccinated and protected that we've achieved at least some semblance of herd immunity. And both possibilities take time. And until then, social distancing and travel restrictions are likely here to stay. Both Australia and New Zealand have already announced that their borders are likely to stay closed through most or all of 2021. And Canada is making travel restrictions more stringent, not less, even as the vaccine rollout begins. So, and there are some other issues. How long does immunity last? Will the virus mutate enough to escape the va vaccine? Will it, when will it be approved for children? How do we overcome vaccine hesitancy? What difference does it make that different vaccines have different efficacy rates? All of these are kind of unanswered questions at the moment. And so what I've seen this month in my practice is this sort of huge wave of pandemic fatigue sweeping through the population. Because I think from the heights of hope around the announcement of the vaccines, uh, the reality of what it will actually take to deploy them has led to a little bit of rebound despair. And because we're all still homeschooling our children and missing our families and friends and travel and wondering if we'll ever return to normal life. But I'd say like, hang on, you know, the, tu the tunnel is long, but there is a light at the end of it. And if we do manage to get this pandemic controlled within two or two and a half years, that will actually make it one of the shortest major pandemic events in history. So we just have to be patient. I think it's not time to toss out our face mask yet. Uh, but I hope when the time comes that all of you will roll up your sleeves and get your jab. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. And thank you for the optimism this morning. That's great to, to hear. Uh, I will now hand it over to uh, Dr. Karen Grépin. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so yeah, thanks for, for that introduction and thanks for the other speakers. Um, I'm going to be speaking about something a little bit different, I think. Um, so my background is that I have been uh, looking at the ways that governments respond to infectious disease outbreaks, going back to HIV, but of being very also very involved in uh, quite a number of recent Ebola outbreaks, uh, most recently involved in three Ebola outbreaks in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, so I was very involved in the space when COVID hit, and um, along with some researchers in Canada, in fact, at Simon Fraser University, we have for the last year been studying the, uh, the ways in which different countries have adopted international travel regulations and uh, looking at that from both an epidemiological but also from economic and, perspective and, and political perspectives to try to understand why countries are doing what they're doing with regards to travel restrictions. So just a little bit on that. Um, so uh, on January 30th, 2020, so almost exactly a year ago, the World Health Organiza Organization announced what we now know as COVID-19 to be a public health emergency of international concern. Um, they did this through a, a global legal framework known as the International Health Regulations, which you may not be super aware of, but is actually very important because what it did is it provided for the WHO, the, the legal authority to mount a internationally coordinated a global response to the pandemic. And it also provided the World Health Organization the legal authority to impose um, uh, recommendations or provide recommendations to countries whether or not they want to uh, invoke travel regulations and trade regu regulations um, uh, on other countries. While the WHO has not yet ever officially recommended the adoption of any uh, inter uh, travel regulation or trade regulation in the context of the COVID pandemic, what we do know from our research is that by the end of March, every single country in the world had imposed some form of uh, international border restriction to try to curb the spread of, of COVID-19. This varies a lot from country to country. Some countries have quite minimal things in place and some countries have literally sealed their borders off to all, uh, all incoming travelers since, uh, since last year. So there's a quite a large range in terms of what has actually happened. Um, so that, that being said, that's sort of the context in the background, um, thinking about what does that mean for us here in Hong Kong and what does that mean in terms of uh, when will travel return to normal. Um, I like to think that there's sort of three, thing, three things at least that we will require um, in, in order for us to think about 
some sort of normalcy. And I just want to caveat this by saying, I don't think real normal travel like we had been accustomed to in the past is actually something that's going to happen within the next couple of years. Um, I think that is, is going to take a really long time. But what I mean by sort of normal here, even the idea of being able to get on a plane to go on vacation, when will that kind of stuff start to happen? Um, so from what we're, what we're seeing uh, right now, what's happening, in fact, um, many countries are actually in the process of thinking about imposing more travel restrictions. Um, the, the global consensus around travel regulations is that um, while they are not perfect, while they are not foolproof, they can play very critical roles for epidemics at certain stages in their pandemic control. And for example, once countries do have low levels of community transmission, having strict um, uh, control measures in place actually help keep uh, your, your numbers of, in, in your own local community down. So in fact, my, my, my first prediction is actually we'll see more of these measures adopted in the, in the coming months. In fact, just this week, we've seen the UK, we've seen the United States, um, kind of big global holdouts on some of these stricter uh, um, regimes have actually started to introduce them. Canada is currently mulling a two week mandatory hotel quarantine. Um, I did the rounds this week on CBC and CTV. I think it's quite likely that something like that will, will actually be adopted in the coming weeks, if not this week. Um, so what does that mean for us in Hong Kong? When do we think travel will reopen? I think there's really three conditions. One, so one, I think most of the world needs to be vaccinated before we see any sort of return to uh, global um, travel. And I'll come back to that. Um, second, we need to become confident that the vaccine actually does something with regards to per lowering the risk of transmission, not just whether or not people get sick, but whether it actually prevents transmission. And then finally, we need to get other countries to actually get their outbreaks under control. And, and, and I'll come back to that as well. So without that first point about most of the world being vaccinated here, I'm actually not that optimistic. Um, so first off, most countries are not planning to vaccinate their children, right? So that's about a third of the world that will not be vaccinated. It's not even being uh, discussed widely in terms of who's going to be vaccinated or not. Um, at best, uh, we think about 2 billion people might get access to the vaccine this year, which is, is quite remarkable. It's quite amazing. But at the same time, too, that means 5 billion people are not. And so what are the implications of that for true global travel when you know, most of the world is not vaccinated? Um, there are a lot of issues around supply. We're seeing vaccine, what we call vaccine nationalism, really rearing its ugly head right now. Countries are going to be clamping down on the export of vaccines. So even what we think we are probably to get here in Hong Kong in terms of our global supply may actually change just because um, the global pandemic is, is shifting. The United States finally has decided it wants to control this outbreak and has suddenly decided it needs 200 million doses in the next three months. And so that's how it's reverberating through the global supply chains. Um, so here in Hong Kong, I think it's unrealistic that most of us will get vaccinated much before summer, and that's in a good case scenario, end of the year in a, in a more realistic scenario, potentially. Um, it also, how we vaccinate is going to make a big difference. You know, most countries right now are currently um, uh, prioritizing their seniors, their, their frontline health workers. That's fantastic, but it means that the epidemics themselves will not slow down for a long time. Um, and then, and then um, you know, there's other issues there in terms of, you know, how, how long it's going to take, right? So even today, the best performing countries, with the exception of Israel, no one has fully vaccinated more than 1% of their population, and that's within two months. So on the, on, the, on the confidency about transmission, I think Sarah has mentioned this, so I won't repeat this. We don't know how long, you know, we don't know how, 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 what, what vaccine does in terms of your ability to transmit the virus. But I think also importantly, we don't know how long your, your, your immunity is going to last. And so if we have to start talking about revaccinating people within the same time frame where we're still vaccinating most of the world, that could add another challenge. And then finally, with regards to you know, how other countries are doing, most countries in the world outside of Asia have not managed to get their outbreaks under control. Um, the next, uh, the situation in the world globally right now is the worst that it's ever been in the pandemic. This week, we hit over 100 million known cases of COVID, which probably means a lot more. Um, cases are not coming down in many places, uh, places like the UK, places in Europe, and even Canada are, are experiencing very high levels of community transmission. It's going to be a grim quarter, if not two quarters globally. And so I think in that, in that, with that kind of background, I don't see places like Hong Kong and Asia really wanting to open up with those places. So I'll stop there with my comments, and um, I look forward to hearing other people's comments as well. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Karen Grépin. I will now hand it over to uh, Han Lam from Air Canada, as we can all start booking or hoping to book our tickets for next summer, or as you said most likely end of the year of 2021. Han Lam, over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Amelie, for the introduction. Um, I look after Hong Kong and Southeast Asia um, specifically for Air Canada. Um, in Air Canada, we used to fly two flights a day between Hong Kong and Canada last year. But this year, because of COVID, um, reduce, uh, we have reduced demand um, by about um, 70%. And we have seen that um, in our bookings. So right now we are flying three times a week to Vancouver and once a week to Toronto. Now, thanks to the 300,000 Canadians who are living in Hong Kong, we are still seeing very regular demand between the two places. Um, needless to say, COVID has been very, very impactful on our business. Um, our travel demand has been very sensitive to all kinds of government restrictions that are put in place. Um, the most recent of which would be the 21-9 quarantine in Hong Kong um, and, um, you know, um, and pre-departure test, etc. But we are very supportive of anything that the government has to do because we are in a safety business. And that is the first and foremost, our priority is to keep our customers safe and to make sure that if we ever to uh, resume travel and support the global efforts of resuming travel, we are doing that safely. Um, we do think that the vaccine is a long-term recovery solution for air travel. And in fact, um, it has been talked about every day internally at the head office and even in, um, in other markets um, within Asia. So we have a global task force uh, looking at vaccination rates at different countries, looking at the efficacy rates of these vaccines, and I think the fellow panelists are extremely spot on when we talk about um, looking at the medical science and the data of how effective these vaccines are in preventing transmission instead of just developing an illness or symptoms of COVID-19. Um, and um, once we have got that kind of medical information and once we have eventually reached herd immunity, um, by vaccinating a majority of the population. And if we can see that the vaccine is actually effective and for a durable amount of time, then it relies on the government to then decide, you know, how do they reopen border? And I think Todd is extremely right in pointing out that um, we may see a mixture of vaccines and testing in the foreseeable future. There will be a mixed bag of, you know, having been tested and showing your vaccination record before you can get on board. So travel will resume. Um, we are hopeful that um, vaccine is the long-term solution for reopening travel. It is a path to reopening travel, but it will be quite a long path. And it's not very clear what that path looks like yet. Because once we think about um, if government have decided to use the vaccination record to open travel, um, how do we operationalize it? Do we need the health passport? Do we need a digital health uh, uh, app or, uh, or some kind of record to make sure that the vaccine is actually genuine and, and the record and the certificate is genuine. So there's a lot more work to do, I'm afraid. Um, I will um, hold my breath. Um, I will be very happy if we can all start flying for Christmas to see the rest of our family in other countries. So go back Thank to you. you. Thank you, Han, for this. and. Um, and we wish you the best of luck. I know that Hair Canada has been heavily hit, obviously, by the pandemic. And we know these are not easy times for you. So you have all of our support and encouragements from our, our community. I'll start with a question uh, and, and address it to Todd. Todd, you know, you mentioned that there were things going on in Asia Pacific and Singapore. I'd like to ask, there are two things I'd like to ask. One, what are the countries, jurisdictions that you see are the most uh, progressive at the forefront of trying to resume traveling? And, and who are the main actors in your opinion? I mean, Collinson ha has had to pivot as you, as you mentioned, and you also mentioned associations and common past. What are the key organizations that you're seeing in the world that you know are really trying to work on resuming traveling or at least putting in place measures that will help us travel again? So um, a couple months ago, I would have said it was Hong Kong and Singapore, um, you know, being being truly the the first two countries that were trying to establish a a, a bilateral bubble. Um, we obviously know that that bubble popped, and there there was intent of of both governments of of reestablishing that bubble. But but even since that time, 
Hong Kong's government has, has, has shifted their position because the most important border in the world for them is the Chinese border. And the Chinese authorities have been very clear about you know, zero cases. Um, and so that, that is uh, the, the unilateral focus of, of the Hong Kong government right, right now. Um, I think you, we, you know, we've seen some, um, I guess, some progressive moves on the, the cross Tasman uh, piece between Australia and New Zealand. But even in the last few days, that's had a little bit of a setback because uh, a traveler was found with the, uh, the South African variant. Um, and, and that's put a, a three day hold on it. Um, I, think, I think each country is trying to learn from themselves. Hong Kong's probably been the most aggressive relative to all of the, the restrictions, et cetera, the 21 day quarantine, the move to the hotel quarantine, now the flight crew, uh, 14 day quarantine, the, the, the uh, PCR testing, the testing of the communities, um, the free testing of the communities, et cetera, uh, probably has been the most aggressive. And then we've obviously seen a lot of countries where it hasn't been as, as, uh, as aggressive. And, and now those restrictions are, as we've heard earlier, are, are coming to be put in place. It is a complex road ahead on a bilateral and a multilateral conversation. Um, you know, Jeff, uh, Jeff and Patricia, who are on this call, have, have been both very supportive of some of the conversations that that Hon and I have been in with the uh, the Hong Kong government and and trying to create uh, some sort of dialogue there. But it's tough because these countries are first and foremost they care about the safety within their borders, and that is the right that is the right thing for them to do is to care about that safety within their borders, um, as Karen has said. Um, unless we see the the control within borders, it's very very difficult to to open borders. Um, and then coming to your, your other point, the associations and, and the digital passes, um, you know, you've got probably far too many. Uh, organizations that are trying to create digital passes right now. And, and my concern is we're going to end up in a situation of a proliferation of, uh, of platforms rather than two or three that interoperate. Um, you know, we, are, we are supportive of, of Common Pass because of its relationship with World Economic Forum and as, a, as an NGO. Um, and we're also supportive of, I, of IATA. Um, the nice thing about IATA is, is their uh, Timotech um, capability or rules engine is already in place, right? It's it's already there relative to visas um, associated with passports. I th Their system already knows as a Canadian that I can go into into Vietnam with X, um, uh, with X uh, uh, visa. But what it doesn't have yet is all the content that will be required by different co countries and the protocols they accept. And that's a long road ahead. So I'm hopeful that you there is a collaboration between governments um, and industry organizations to choose two or three, um, because otherwise it's a very long road ahead of creating interoperability. I mean, the integrations that we've been doing ourselves with with IATA, with Common Pass, etc. These are not easy, and we're talking about you, you'll have to have literally uh, hundreds of thousands of, of integration points, um, and then if you multiply that by uh, 30 or 40 different health passports, it's going to be a very challenging road ahead. Thank you, Ton. I'm receiving some great questions in the chat boxes here. So I'm gonna jump into that right away. Perhaps a question for Dr. Karen Grépin. Do you think vaccinated travels may not be required to quarantine in the future in Hong Kong and or Canada? That's a great question. Um, I think, um, so sometimes I like to refer to the quarantines as a country's safety blanket. Um, they are uh, the type of measure that's actually relatively easy to impose in that, you know, people can still come and go. But at the same time, it provides the, um, you know, the public health uh, supervision that helps reduce the risk of transmission quite a bit. I, so for the foreseeable future, I actually don't see countries uh, removing the restriction. Um, on quarantine uh, for anyone. Um, and, and that's, you know, as at this moment, mostly because of a lot of this uncertainty about what we know about the, the impact of vaccination on transmission. But I think more broadly, um, countries that have these um, uh, quarantine measures in, in place have really started to get used to them and have really started to like them. Um, and so because of that, I think um, it will take a lot to convince them to really want it to, to get, get rid of them. I could foresee them maybe reducing them. I think 21 days is, is, a, is, is longer than anywhere else in the world right now. So 
Um, you know, I could imagine it, it getting shorter. I could see it, it shortening even more with increased testing, increased uh, those types of controls on it, but I don't see it going away in the short run. Thank you, thank you, Karen. I have another question and perhaps um, Dr. Sarah Berwin can answer this one. Uh, it was noted that there's not much talk about vaccination for children. What is the medical scientific rationale here for not considering vaccination for children or is it more of a policy issue? And what risk do we need to be aware of? You have to unmute yourself, Sarah. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yep. Yeah. So the issue is really that the vaccine testing was only done on adults. And uh, that's typical with vaccines that they usually are tested first and most vaccines are tested first in adults. So we don't have data on children. There is some, there's testing now going on in sort of the 12 to 16 or 18 year old group. And that is also typically how things work. You first test adults, make sure it's safe in adults and you move back and then you go to the the children. I think eventually they should be approved in children. It's definitely harder to recruit vac uh, vaccine trial uh, uh, participants for children. Not very many people want to volunteer their children to be in the trials, but, uh, but it is what will happen eventually. It isn't really a, reason, a concern that we think the vaccine is likely to be unsafe in children. It's more that it hasn't been tested. And secondly, we know that children are not the group that are most vulnerable to falling, to dying or falling very sick with COVID. We do need to protect them in order to protect the whole population, but it's not the top priority. And so uh, it's just gonna take more time. Uh, ultimately, we do need to vaccinate children too. And in fact, with most very infectious diseases, we found that vaccinating children is the way to protect the whole population because we have a framework for getting all children vaccinated. We don't have the same kind of framework for getting all adults vaccinated. And it's often easier to vaccinate children to protect adults, but we're, not, we're a long way from that. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I know that someone raised their hand in the attendees list. Uh, if you wanna raise your hand again, if you have a question. Uh, alternatively, I will uh, ask a question to Han. Uh, Han, what can you share about, you know, the, how the market reacted to the uh, announcement of vaccines? You know, I've read some articles about a huge uptake in bookings, people booking flights and, and, and hotels. Have you witnessed this yourself? And what can you share uh, with our audience about the current traveling between Hong Kong and Canada in terms of volume and the, the routes that are operational today? Yes, well, I wish we did see that uptick in bookings, but in reality, we, we haven't. Um, what is um, the driving factor between uh, behind the bookings is, you know, the relaxation of um, travel restrictions. And um, as we all know, um, travel restrictions right now have been tightening up rather than relaxing. Um, so unfortunately, we haven't seen that um, um, uptick in, in travel. And in fact, um, the moment when um, Hong Kong government announced the 21-9 quarantine in the hotel, we saw a nosedive in our bookings by about a third to even half. Um, so that tells us that that is the single most important driver and, and determining factor in, in people's appetite to travel. I think um, the news about vaccine is hopeful, and I think uh, and Todd is completely right to, to point out that um, we are still quite a long way out um, from um, using vaccination to replace quarantine, because I think there's another thing that we have to consider. If you think about a country like Canada, um, all of those travel restrictions are there to protect the healthcare system of that country. So instead of just looking at the vaccination um, uptake in Hong Kong, we also need to consider and look at very closely the vaccination records in, in Canada, if we are thinking about flying to Canada, for example. Um, if, for example, you know, what population of vaccines have, have, been, um, have been implemented and, um, and um, you know, what's the, what's the public's um, reaction, et cetera? Do we have delays in vaccines? You know, there's a, just a lot of um, uncertainties um, out there um, at the moment. And, um, and um, yeah, I, I wish there is um, uh, a, a quicker um, solution to that, but we really believe that vaccine is the way out but we just don't know how it's going to play out yet because 
once we have um, uh, the, uh, the, the herd immunity and once the government can consider using vaccination to even shorten quarantine, we still have to police it at the frontline transportation supplier. You know, how do we verify that people have really indeed um, uh, been vaccinated? And I think to that, we need a global industry solution. It is just not about one airline or one government or one airport going at it on their own. We need to consolidate some of those travel passes, health passports, and we need a global industry solution to that if we are going to resume travel in a timely manner. Thank you, Han. And, and I think everyone all over the world would hope for a more global response, right, to the crisis we're going through. And um, the WHO director last week spoke publicly of a moral failure. Uh, and, and, and we know geopolitics plays into the way things are currently being handled by, by different countries. But um, I, I'd be interested to know from, um, from Karen Grepin, you know, what are your thoughts on, on the way the WHO has handled the situation so far? <laughs> um, I mean, we can all, all agree that there has been a failure in worldwide cooperation. And how do we move on from this situation? What is it that we can improve and, 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 um, and foster in terms of, of, of world engagement? I think that's an excellent question. So at the beginning, when I mentioned those international health regulations, right, that was the multilateral framework that we, the world, all had agreed upon uh, that would dictate how we would react in, when faced with an outbreak of this nature. Um, it has been used in the past before. Uh, it withstood, for the most part, our reactions to it. But I think it's pretty clear to say that the international health regulations have died. Um, the, uh, the structure that was in place did not, um, uh, was not sufficient to, to allow for countries to work together in a coordinated way, especially around issues around travel, but also around issues like we're seeing, for example, on vaccine nationalism and the sort of hoarding of, of goods and supplies. Um, and so right now at this very moment, um, multilateral and, and international efforts to get us working together are, are at an all-time low. Um, it is, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it is the fault of the World Health Organization per se, um, but we all as countries did not behave uh, as we said we would. And as a result, we are not working together. Um, I think it's wonderful to see uh, private industries, uh, international networks like, uh, like airlines, IATA and others. They're the ones that actually seem to be leading in terms of being able to get uh, players from around the world to actually work together to try to, to find solutions out of this problem. Um, but at the same time, too, I don't think that's going to really solve it until countries start to get together and, and solve it. So uh, multilateralism is also the way out of this pandemic. And at the moment, it's I'm not particularly hopeful. But we do need to find, start to find ways of working together as countries if, if we want to get the world traveling uh, in anything close to what we were traveling before. Thank you. I have a question that we received in regards to the three vaccines, and, and perhaps, uh, Sarah, you can answer this. So I'm going to read the question. What is the difference between the Chinese vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, the Russian vaccine, and the AstraZeneca vaccine, and which one do you believe is the safest? Yeah. Not politically charged at all. Not at all. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Okay, but question. <laughs> it was the Chinese vaccine, the Russian, the AstraZeneca, and the Pfizer, right? Yeah. So, uh, so they're different. They're different vaccine technologies, different platforms. The uh, the Chinese vaccines, there are actually several ones, but I think the Sinovac vaccine is an inactivated uh, viral vi whole virus vaccine. It's an old tried and true technology, so it has that kind of comfort associated with it. Uh, but they have not been terribly transparent with their data, and uh, that's making people uncomfortable. There have been phase three trials that have been conducted in Turkey and Brazil and in Indonesia, all of which have given somewhat different results. They've given a lot of doses in China. We don't know exactly what the data show on that. And so they, they may be very good, uh, but we don't actually have all the data. And most most people in the scientific community don't really like to back a vaccine before the phase three data have been peer reviewed and, and released and, and vetted. Uh, then the Pfizer vaccine uh, is an mRNA vaccine. 
And that is a new technology. It's actually a really exciting technology. If it pans out as well as it looks like it is, it may have broad applications in other areas, other not just for vaccines, but for other, um, other disease processes. Uh, and it, it has phase three trial results that were very promising. It looks to be uh, at least about 90 to 95% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID. We don't know if how well it prevents asymptomatic COVID and how well it prevents transmission to others, but it definitely seems to have at least a significant effect on preventing people from getting very sick and dying. And it looks like it's very safe. The caveat being that it has a somewhat higher rate of allergic reactions uh, than uh, other vaccines. Still very rare, but it's in the order of 11 in a million versus say 1.3 in a million for the flu vaccine. And people, it hasn't led to deaths from allergic reaction, but people needing care for allergic reactions. It, that is probably because the, the Pfizer vaccine, the mRNA vaccine is very fragile. mRNA degrades really quickly. And so to protect it from degrading, it's being coated in this lipid kind of blanket that melts if it's not kept at very low temperature. And part of that lipid coating is uh, something called polyethylene glycol which sounds very chemical and scary, but it's actually a common laxative. Uh, and, and people who are allergic to that or polysorbate may be at higher risk for developing an allergic reaction. That problem is a problem that it, it's affecting not just the allergic reactions, but also the, the storage and transport of the vaccine. Pfizer has actually said that they will come up with a freeze dried version by next year. So we'll see. Uh, and that's the vaccine that's being deployed in the US and in Canada is one of the vaccines. Uh, there's another mRNA vaccine, Moderna, that is also being deployed, but that we're not in line to get here. So, but it is the first vaccine coming into Hong Kong. And it is also the vaccine that's being deployed in Israel, which is a really interesting place to watch because they kind of made a deal with Pfizer that if they gave them enough vaccine, they'd give them lots of data and um, they are, they're going gangbusters with their vaccine program. So it'll be an interesting place to watch. It's a country that had a lot of COVID and so is a good place to test the vaccine. Uh, AstraZeneca, also a new technology. It's, a, it's, a, um, what, it's an adenovirus vector vaccine. That means you use a vac another virus to transport the antigen into the body. And that virus is actually from a chimpanzee. It's, so it's one that a human, it doesn't make humans sick, but it also is one we don't, already have an immune response to that will interfere. And so that's also new. It's also quite an exciting technology. Uh, it has released, AstraZeneca has released phase three data, but they're kind of murky a little bit. And we're still kind of waiting for some clarification on exactly how well it works. Uh, but it does look to be safe and at least somewhat, at least somewhat effective, possibly not as effective as the mRNA ones. The Russian vaccine, is very much like AstraZeneca. I think uh, some people think it was copied, but, uh, but uh, there's not a huge amount of data out on that one either. So um, right now, a Pfizer is gonna be the only vaccine available, at least in the short term in Hong Kong. And uh, th there's a huge amount of experience already with it. There's you know millions of doses have been given of that vaccine. So I think we already have a pretty good idea that it's safe and we think it's effective. And so, yes, I mean, I would, I would definitely take that vaccine. Thank you, Sarah. We have some other great questions coming in. So I, it's in regards to traveling. When, um, when airline travel starts to open up again, what's the view on the cost of flights vis-a-vis pre-COVID? And I, I have a, a, another question in relation to that. Emirates Airlines introduced recently and Yada Travel Health Pass in certain selected air routes. Will Air Canada and Singapore Airlines do the same? And if yes, which air routes? Should I answer that? Go ahead on. Okay, yeah, so um, talking about the travel pass, that is something that um, is also under consideration because you know we are looking at all kinds of um, electronic um, travel um, solutions as well. Um, but I think, you know, the focus right now is really uh, looking at the efficacy of the vaccine and to look at how and if 
um, the vaccine is going to change any of the travel restrictions because I think once we have got that uncertainty uh, um, cleared, then we can start talking about you know demand and recovery and how we operationalize um, how we police whether or not people have been vaccinated or have been tested, etc. Um, say um, to, if you take Canada as an example, Canada is actually um, quite a, a specific case because you know Canadian government does require uh, all the travelers to have. Uh, log all of their uh, uh, details and contact details and COVID testing records in an, in an app well before they travel. So the arrive can app uh, is something that is mandatory for all arrivals. So, you know, Canada has a specific requirement, but, um, but yeah, that, that is under consideration. You know, whatever that uh, uh, will make travel easier. Uh, we talk about it being a global effort, WHO, IATA, um, all the parties have got to agree on a workable solution. And I think, you know, it looks like the IATA travel pass is one of those that uh, is being considered. But, you know, we need to look at the vaccine first and we need to look at if that has any impact um, on, on travel restrictions. Um, the second question about um, ticket prices, um, that's a million dollar question, I'm afraid. Um, it really, really depends how fast demand will come back. And it really depends on how quickly um, airlines can redeploy the fleet to cater for that demand again. So, you know, it's always a question of demand and supply. If we do see that uh, um, demand has outstripped supply, then yeah, there could be some pressure on prices. Um, but, um, but if that's the other way around, if um, airlines are being overly optimistic and we redeploy a huge amount of spare capacity in the market, then you know naturally prices will go down. So it really depends on uh, not just ourselves, but you know how other players in the market will see and forecast demand, and how quickly we can redeploy capacity and aircraft into the market. Thank you, Han. And I think um, we just I, I yes. can touch upon the Singapore Airlines um, part of that question. Uh, so Singapore Airlines is currently uh, trialing what's called Safe Pass, which is a Tomasic. Um, they're a Tomasic company being the, the sovereign fund of Singapore, um, but phase two, um, they're looking at IATA. Um, phase three, they're looking at potentially common pass. So, you know, this is, this is where they recognize that there won't just be one, um, that there will be multiples. But the challenge with that is, in terms of which routes is fully dependent on bilateral and multilateral acceptance of those passes on the other end. So, uh, we'll we'll see we'll see at least safe pass and and uh, the IATA uh, pass in play in Singapore, um, but until you get the other side of the equation uh, agreeing to it, whether that'll depend de determine which routes um, it can be deployed on. Thank you. We just have five minutes left, and if I may, I'd like to end with this question to you all: What is uh, what are the lessons that you've learned so far in your industry in regards to the pandemic? If you just had one or two lessons, and if you could share that with, with us. I don't know if we can start with um, Karen, <laughs> Karen Grippin. Yeah, I mean, I think um, for me as someone who studies the way in which governments work together, um, it's been a very sad last year in that it, it's been a complete awareness of, of how unprepared we were as a global community to, to deal with something like this um, and, and how, how we've managed to do so badly working together in the future. So what I, I take away from that, I think um, I, what I'm quite worried about is what the next pandemic is gonna look like and you know are we gonna be prepared for that? So in terms of lessons, this has been an, an incredible experience. It's also been an experience for us to learn how to better uh, work together in the future so that we this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, I guess in some ways I, I, I have found the last year sad as well for the same reasons as Karen. But also I think in some ways we've, we've also just failed as a human species to learn from history. You know, there were, I, I read an article where it said that, you know, there are kind of three reasons why we can't get the pandemic under control. And uh, I can remember them all. Number one was that everybody thinks that they're going to be in the 98% who don't die from this. Everybody thinks that's going to be them. Number two, we ask people to take actions, not just for themselves, but for the sake of protecting others. 
and people don't all do that. And number three, um, the disease is transmissible by people who don't have obvious symptoms. The thing is that that was an article that was published in Science in May of 1919, and it was about the Spanish flu. Wow. So, you know, 101 years later, we're in exactly the same place, and we should have learned some lessons from history. I hope we learned some lessons from this event. Um, I think one thing, and my daughter pointed this out, uh, she's, you know, had struggled with all the, the restrictions in Canada. She's a young person who, you know, young people in their 20s really are hard hit by this because they're not the ones who are going to get very sick, but their lives are greatly affected by this. And I think her point, which I think is incredibly valid, is that we need to maybe hear less from people, the doctors and the, uh, sorry, the epidemiologists and the scientists and more from the behavioral psychologists and the, you know, the how do we change people's behavior? Because we don't do it by telling people they're bad people if they don't wear masks or, you know, so we need better ways of, of helping people to understand how to manage this and how to change their behavior. So I think those are the two big things for me. Han, Todd? Yeah, so as an industry that has been so severely impacted by COVID, um, I think for me is to keep our eyes on the future. Um, I always talk about um, COVID being a bit like a marathon and it's just that the end game, the finishing line of this marathon has actually been ever uh, extended uh, on an ongoing basis. So you don't really know how and when you finish, but we will get there. Um, that's the first thing. So that requires a lot of resilience and that requires a lot of um, collaboration efforts um, with other industry partners as well. So I think in the past, um, the airline industry, I mean, it, it, it still is. It, we are a very competitive industry. There are a lot of other players in there. But when it comes to health and safety, I think it's important that we have to work together um, between um, IATA, WHO, clinics, healthcare providers, etc. And I think collaboration is the key and it is the way to get us out of this in a timely manner. I, I was going to feed off actually what, what Hans said. I was going to talk about the industry collaboration. I, I've been um, really excited to see the industry collaboration that's happened and, and collaboration amongst competitors. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure when the last time uh, Air Canada and Cathay Pacific were on the same call talking about the same route and how to get that route open, opened again, right? Um, and, and we've been on those kind of calls and, and, and that's, really, that's really heartening. Um, you know, seeing collaboration, same thing. Um, Sky Team, Star Alliance and One World all on the same call having conversations about how do we, how do we collaborate? This, we're all in this together. It's all about the return of safe travel. And, and that word safe, every single uh, party in that, uh, in that chain is, is talking about the safety. Um, the flip side of that is, is I've realized how bloody hard it is to get multilateral collaboration on a government perspective. Um, not just multilateral, not just bilateral, but actual, actually unilateral. Getting, <clears throat> getting governments in t inside of borders to actually align, getting different departments, getting health department to co collaborate with the commerce department, et cetera, and get the same view is, is extremely, extremely challenging. And, and I think I've had my eyes opened up. Um, I, I've, I've engaged with governments for a long time in my career, but, but this, this has really opened up my eyes to how challenging that is. Uh, well, thank you all for your time this morning. Really, um, this was wonderful to hear your views and insights. I've heard that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Obviously, we just have to be more patient. I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Karen Grippin, for the wonderful work you're doing. Um, the type of research that you're doing will be instrumental in for our societies in the world to prepare for the next pandemic, and we hope we can learn from our, our mistakes. Han Lam, I am dreaming of the day I will fly with Air Canada and get to see my parents and my grandmother, brother and sister again. I hope you can, we can continue working closely with you at the Canadian Chamber. Dr. Sarah Barwain, thank you again and thank you for your optimism um, and giving us clarity on, on the different vaccines um, the world are is talking about. And lastly, Todd, thank you very much. Um, companies like Collinson who are pivoting right now are, are leading the way for us. And, um, and we all dream of traveling again. 
and, and, and getting back to some sort of normalcy, even if we do understand that we will have to live with the virus for a very long time. So thank you all for your time. This was wonderful. Thank you all to the participants. And I know some people are struggling. We are all you know, experiencing this pandemic very differently. Just wanted to know that you are not alone if at times you find it hard. I personally find it very hard <laughs> and, um, and no one's alone. We're all in this together. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Stay safe and stay healthy.